Well, undoubtedly, I didn't do so hot, did I? <laughs> oh, man. No one's telling what Brother Jimmy's going to say. You might as well just be ready, because, uh, of course, you know, it doesn't matter as long as I get the love offering. That's all that really matters. <laughs> oh, boy, yeah, I see some back there. I thought they were full of the Holy Ghost, and they're freezing to death, brother. <laughs> Amen. I appreciate being here. Always do. Dr. John Phillips is very special to me. And uh, in, in the meetings I've been with him, uh, never fails to thrill me with the Word of God. Just makes me want to know the book. And uh, so, some of the stuff, that uh, the messages that he brings are just right to the heart. What we need, especially in this age when we're looking for so, many extra, so much extra biblical stuff, but thank God for those that are staying by the stuff. Brother Bill Sturm, always glad to see Brother Bill. I talked to him. So I talked to some folks after the Woodstock conference down in Georgia. And uh, so I asked some of the folks, I said, well, tell me, who blessed you? I said, well, there's some old boy. He uh, said he's a little heavy. And when he turned around and started up the steps, his legs went this way. I said, <laughs> Bill Sturm. I said, and here's what they said. They said, he lit my fire. And I praise the Lord for what God's doing. And preachers that are just flat, just preaching the truth and telling it like it is. And thank you for Brother Jimmy. Always glad to be with you and Francis and all of you that are here tonight. Let's pray God just meet us. Amen. Boy, I tell you, after, <laughs> after that message on the rapture, whew, my soul, just think, even right now, the shout may be just about ready. I may never see Chattanooga, Tennessee again, but who cares if I can see Jesus? Thank you, Dr. John. I love you, brother. Very, very special man of God. Ed, Greg, I love you, brother. I'm glad to see you. Amen. No, you're walking through the storms physically, but I want to tell you, bless my life. And I'm glad to see you. Amen. Thank God for the people. And I tell you, as you get older, brother, you, you, you don't forget the people that's blessed you and touched your lives. Amen. All right. Well, where, where am I going tonight? Turn to Isaiah chapter 64, the 64th chapter of the book of Isaiah. <laughs> I guess I'm tired of these fellas repronouncing these books for me after I've, some fellow tonight said it. I said, I'm preaching from Habakkuk, and so I was informed that it's Habakkuk. I said, sound like a KKK to me. Just leave me alone. I want to say it like I want to. It's Habakkuk. So I, then the other day I was preaching on the little book of Philemon, and a fellow came up and said, Man, you need to learn your pronunciation. I said, Well, what is he? He said, Philemon. <laughs> I said, My soul, that's the first one. We got some great scholars out there pronouncing these words. But anyway, I'm going to call him Isaiah, and you can say what you want to. All right? I says, I really don't care if you don't know the truth. <laughs> Isaiah 64, and I believe here's the heart cry of what this meeting is all about and what we're all here for, and especially when we hear the message on the second coming. Whether we have revival or not, the rapture will be revival for the saints of God. And people sort of critical of us who believe that there is a possibility that if America repents and the world repents and turns back to God, God could bring revival around this world. Whether it'll happen or not, I do not know, but I'm going to preach like it can. And uh, after all, I believe many times we fail to see that God is so sovereign that in any given time He can move where He wills and turn things around. I just read the other day on J. Edwin Orr's book about the meeting in New England states of years ago and some things I did not know. And we'll talk about them in just a little while. All right, Isaiah 64. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things, which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. And for the sake of time, if you will, as far as I'm going to read, but we'll deal with the whole chapter as Isaiah talks about the, the theme of his heart, the cry of his heart. O oh God, if you would just come down where the mountains can flow down, and even the adversaries will know who you are 
and nations will tremble at thy presence. In the first chapter of Isaiah, I think we get a glimpse of some of the things that Isaiah was preaching. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. In this generation, the hardest thing to be is to be an oddball opposite of the spiritual decoys that are being put out today called churches that are being built around what people want to hear and what people want to see. And they're coming by the droves because they found them a country club, a CEO, not a prophet of God who stands for truth. And the, many times what I'm seeing makes me sick. And I go to my room and I cry out to God, Lord, I don't want to be an oddball. I don't want to be in left field. But Lord God, surely what we're seeing today is not what the, what the real church of God is really supposed to be. And yet we're made to look like the fools because we don't have the 10,000 or the 5,000 or the 15,000 people. But if I know anything about Jesus, the closer he moved to the cross and dying for the world, the lesser the people followed him. And if we're going to preach the death to self and tell what the flesh really is, that God hates the flesh, detests the flesh, has nothing to do with the flesh in me or you, and will not bless the flesh, he'll only bless what he initiates and brings to pass by the power of God in my life. All else is a curse and a stench to the nostrils of Almighty God. Isaiah talked about it in Isaiah chapter 1. If you look back, verse 2, he said, I've nourished and brought up children. They've rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his master, the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people does not consider. In other words, even a donkey knows where the barn is. Amen. Even a donkey knows who mastered him. But my people, whom I've, ma whom I've raised and reared, they don't know. They've rebelled, and they don't even know who their Lord and Master really is. He said, Ah, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They've forsaken the Lord. they provoked the Holy One of Israel in the anger. They've gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. <laughs> Boy, that's not pulling any punches, is it? It doesn't sound like the modern-day sermons I'm hearing today. It doesn't like the books I'm reading today on the love of God as if God didn't hate. There's no balance anymore. This ooey-gooey love of God all over on one side that God just loves, 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 yes, and he hates, hates, hates. Amen? The balance. God loves. God hates. He even said he hated Esau two times. Once in the book of Malachi, uh, and, and Micah, I'm sorry, once in the book of Micah, and then once in the book of Romans. Esau, have I hated. God hates. And here's Isaiah. He said, from the sole of your foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They had not been closed or bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country's desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it's a desolate as overthrown. And he goes on and on and on and on. Boy, that's how he started out in Isaiah chapter 1. But I'm glad in chapter, of chapter 18 when he said in the middle of all that judgment and talking about sin, here's what he said. Come and let us reason together. Right in the middle of all the judgment still comes the message of mercy. If you'll still turn back to me, I'll still show mercy. And how do you know that I won't turn and bring blessing if you'll just return unto the Lord? And ladies and gentlemen, we need just God to rend the heavens. Three things I just want to say from this chapter tonight. First of all, what is the meaning of revival? What do we mean when we talk about revival? We talk about it an awful lot. We say a lot about it, and then it sounds like a good word. But what do we really mean? I believe revival means that suddenly when God shows up in a place, dead things begin to come alive. Dead sermons become alive. Dead singing comes alive. Dead listeners come alive. I get so tired of people trying to blame me because they didn't get blessed. Bless God, maybe you didn't bring the blesser or maybe you weren't, didn't have an appetite. I don't take the blame anymore because I'm coming to get blessed, blistered, run over, whatever God wants to happen. But I got news for you. I'm tired of people saying, I'm just not blessed. You got Jesus in you, have a spell. Amen. Amen. We're always looking for something outside of ourselves to bless us. We have it all inside. 
We don't, I don't need anything outside of me. I have it all in Jesus Christ who abides within me. Revival is whenever you see a preacher whom, whose sermons have just good sermons but not lively. I me- remember the many times that I've talked uh, preached with different preachers around the country, great orators and great preachers, great voices, great sermon. But you know, you can always tell whether the anointing of God is on an individual or not. And I remember how many times after some of these fellows have gotten into sin, you have to be reminded of all the times you heard them. Not once were you made, were you made mention of the fact or made known that the anointing of God was upon him. Always all together, great structure, but no anointing, no power, no glory, no evidence that God is even around. Just a good speech, a good orator, a good pulpiteer, but no glory, no life, no earnestness, no power, just a sermon. But you know what? When the Holy Ghost shows up and revival comes, dead sermons suddenly come alive. I tell you what I like about revival, old dead church members come alive. How many times I've seen some of those, <laughs> some, and I, I pastored one church 12 years, folks, and I do know there are some devils in the church. In fact, you know where, where the Bible said in, in 2 Corinthians 12, where it's, Paul said, a messenger of Satan buffeted me? John MacArthur said he believes that's a church member. Well, the word messenger means a person. I don't know where it's so or not, but I've got news for you. I don't know if anything hurts any worse than somebody just on your trail constantly, just bugging you, just cutting you down. Cut, just If just one time God would let you backslide long enough just to belt him once <laughs> and then get right with God. Amen. I had two when I passed the Lupton Drive. <clears throat> I had two. And God, I asked God to move them, even prayed, God, couldn't you at least let me preach their funeral? You know, just anything. <laughs> and don't look at me like that. You've seen a few folks you felt like you could do without, right? <laughs> Isn't it great, though, when the Holy Ghost just moves in in revival? And that old boy that was a bickering and murmuring, never gave, sat with a scowl on his face, watched his watch, hold up his arm and shake it while you're preaching. Anything. And then just sit there and count the ceiling tile while you're preaching. I had a lady in my first church. She thought I was a stuff. Honestly, they came to our church, very wealthy people. They came to our church because they loved prophecy, and I was doing the book of the Revelation, and their pastor was an amillennialist, and so they weren't getting much from the Word of God. So they came to, to, to Clearview, my first church, where I pastored. She did fine until she, till she went and heard some scholar somewhere. I, I don't even know who he was. And she got so spiritually deep, I couldn't touch her anymore. And whenever, whenever I'd get through preaching, she'd say, I'm not getting fed. I said, dear lady, I think I've said enough accidentally to load your wagon if you just listen. <laughs> so finally, she would bring the newspaper. Now what? Listen. She brought the newspaper and sat and read it while I preached. In rebellion. When I, she never had revival. She was still reading it when I left. Amen. She never had revival. But isn't it good when you find those people that have been in that state of bitterness and unkind and never had a good word, negative, scowl, sour, gloomy, never blessed you. In fact, when they came out of the door to shake hands with you, you passed, you, you didn't shake hands, you pulled them by. <laughs> the less you could see of them, the better you were. Amen? But oh, isn't it good? When meaning of revival is when God shows up and all of a sudden zaps that old boy. And he comes down the aisle and says, My God, I've been wasting my time. I'm not what I used to, I'm not what I used to be. When I got saved, I loved God, but I got bitter. I got resentful. Preacher, I hadn't even loved you. I didn't like your sermons. I didn't like anybody. Wasn't just mad at you. I just hated anybody that acted like they were happy because I was so miserable. But now, preacher, I want to love you and I want to support you. And I want to stand by you. And I want to be a part of your ministry. And I'm going to undergird you. I'm going to pray for you. Woo! Praise God. You could almost charge hell on general principles when you get one like, amen? amen? Just one individual suddenly turns around and becomes profitable to the cause of Christ. That's revival. Revival is whenever that singer who at one time was a tremendous singer, but somehow got to depending on his own good performance. No brokenness, no power of God. 
His singing, I had two trios in a church where I pastored at Lupton Drive. The first three, there were three ladies, and they'd come out of a family that was really a, gave me a real problem when I first went there, but they stayed straight and sung and blessed us until another trio came and joined the church that was really better than they as far as being able to really sing. When well, I folks, you know, it's all right as long as you're first. But when somebody comes to take your place that's a little better, it's going to show what you really made out of. I told one of the preachers, I said, listen, just remember that while you're younger and on the trail, you'll be in the first place. But let me remind you, there's somebody right behind you going to take your place. And you're not going to even be on the agenda anymore. You bet, amen. And so I would just, when that trio was saying, they got so jealous of the other one, God took his hand off. And they blamed me. Because when the other one would sing, the glory would fall. When they would sing, people clam up. Why? Their attitude. Their disposition. Until one Sunday night, <laughs> I'll never forget it. Of course, two of those women looked like a right tackle on the Dallas Cowboys football team. They were monsters. And I didn't dare cross them. I would afraid they'd knock my head off. I mean, they were pretty big. And I never shall forget, one Sunday night, Holy Ghost fell. Power of God came in just glory. Manifested presence of Jesus. And here they came down the aisle and fell on the altar and said, We got jealous. We've lost the glory. Would you pray that God would forgive us? And folks, that church went into orbit. Heaven fell. I didn't even preach that night. It was, it was just a glory. Hey, I had no need to preach. Hey, God already done all he could do. My little sermon would have been, <laughs> would have been useless in that atmosphere. And whenever they did that, suddenly revival came to them. Now when they stand to sing, the glory falls. The, the other trio sings, the glory falls. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we just need a revival just so that everything around us comes alive. Services come alive. Giving comes alive. Every part of the service. We just need a heaven-sent Holy Ghost revival. That's what Isaiah is saying. He's an old man now. In chapter 1, he's crying out against sin, and he doesn't cut any corners. And even in Isaiah 6, after he got to the 6th chapter, he experienced that awful time of brokenness when he saw himself. After he saw a holy God, he said, I'm undone. That glorious experience of reducing himself to nothing, and now then he comes to the end of his book and says, God, if you don't do something, I don't have any more to say. My ministry's about over. My life's about gone. Is there some way you could show up in power and let us see a glimpse of your glory? I believe that ought to be the heart cry of every person here tonight. In your church, in this camp meeting, in revival would break out. Heaven would come down. And the glory of God would encompass this place to where we'll never be the same when we leave these campgrounds Monday noon. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know at any given time, God could turn America upside down, round and round, and we could have a Holy Ghost revival. But we're not going to have it with the easy CEO, gooey, gooey, nicey, nicey, user-friendly. Amen? We're not going to have it with that kind of preaching. There must be a confrontation with the Word of God. I tell you, when I get right with God is when somebody confronts me with a word where I need to get right. I'm not going to get right because you tell me to. I'll get right when the Word confronts me. And I must shape up with the Word of God. Amen. Oh, oh, God, we just need you to show up. Not in the meaning of revival, but I want you to look at the must of revival. Just a few things. In verse 1, listen to this. He said, I want you to come down, Lord, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Mountains in the Word of God always speaks of difficulty and opposition. If he say, this mountain be thou removed and cast into the sea, mountains, obstacles, opposition, resistance, murmuring, uh, gossip, greed, unkindness, unforgiving spirit, all kind of obstacles in the church today. All kind that we're not dealing with. 
Said some other the day, I said, we're so busy talking about the excesses of iniquity, we don't even know that it's those inside foxes that's spoiling the vine that we will not even talk about because we had rather have them there to boost our ego for numbers than to have the presence of God in Holy Ghost revival. I made up my mind that I'm not really going to have the big whopping crowds anymore. Just doesn't really matter. If I can just finish my course having been faithful to declare the truth of the Word of God. That's all that really matters. The must, he said, difficulties is a reason why we need revival. There's all kinds of inside problems in the church. Preacher after preacher I'm with. Members are treating them terrible, acting like heathens. Deacons rearing up and church members rearing up over, over garbage, uh, sickening stuff, nursery rhyme stuff, not over souls and not over, not over missions, not over reaching the world for Christ, but over junk, fussing over junk. Oh, we need to get out of the kindergarten business and stand up as men and women of God and get concerned with what God's concerned about. That's what revival's all about. Difficulties. People, they can act like the devil, come right back and sit on a pew the next Sunday and lift their hands and sing Jesus is Lord as backslid as a convict and say they're all right. Why? Because the Bible is not their, their level of living. They have worked him at a level of living that is not scriptural. And when the Bible doesn't say it, ladies and gentlemen, then we have nothing to say. But if the Bible says it, it has been said, and that's it. Amen. Amen. That's why I've had to adjust some of my preaching. Because I'll tell you why. I used to preach against a lot of things that I could not, that really were, really were, didn't matter. And I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about just ex excesses thing. I'm just talking about the one way to get sin to surface in a person's life is to make them find out that what God says is so, whether they like it or not. And the book is our standard for living. Yes. Amen. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of things going on in churches now. It's hard for me to swallow. I'll be honest with you. Some of the dress codes, it's just hard for me to swallow. I mean, I, I, I can't get, I can't, oh. I, don't, I just can't hardly, I can't understand it. We've got difficulties. And, and then if you, if you preach against anything, you're legalistic. You're legalistic. Man, listen, I'm not legalistic. I believe there's a standard of holiness that goes that if Christ is in me, it's going to show in my outward lifestyle, right? <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, some of these churches that are having all these Toronto blessings, they have dances, they drink liquor. Amen. They have no standard against sin. I, that's why I always appreciated old Wilkerson, David Wilkerson. Was it Dave Wilkerson, wasn't it? Even though he was charismatic, there's one thing he would do. He would lower the boom on their sins. I got a tape by him called The Charismatic Itch. <laughs> but he looks at that bunch that had 5,000 charismatics sitting there in front of him. He said, most of you are living in sin because you've heard, learned how to raise your hand and say, I love Jesus, and walk to your trunk tonight and pull a bottle out of the trunk and serve your liquor. I said, I know what you do. He lowered the boom on them. Amen? We, hey, I was in a church that said we are conservative in theology, but we are liberal in lifestyle. That's a new one. That's what they're saying, Brother Jimmy. We're conservative in theology, but we're liberal in lifestyle. I said, it's a lie. Amen. You may say you are in your head, but it's not in your heart. And we're just 18 inches from revival. Amen? Amen. In fact, I was in one of those churches, a rich church. Sunday morning, I was preaching away. I didn't know that they served uh, champagne at weddings and served champagne at church events. I didn't know it wouldn't care if it did. And I was preaching away that morning, and I said, a dram drinker is as much akin to a drunkard as a pig is to a hog. Give him time, he'll make one. <laughs> Woo! Now, if I was preaching for an offering, I did the wrong thing. And if I was preaching for a crowd, I did the wrong thing. But that's what, we've, that's what we're facing today, difficulties. We want to see the world change, but let me live like I want to. I want revival, but don't bother me. I want my schools to have a turning back to God, but leave me out of an encounter or facing people. I want revival as long as I don't have to be interrupted. That's where we are, difficulties. 
Then not only that, he said, we've sinned. It was just the word sin. Look in verse 5. He said, we have sinned. Just the, oh, the bottom of where he says continue. It's just about, for we have sinned. Well, Lord, that's a word you don't even hear much anymore. Uh, no, nothing matters. Everything's all right. Uh, no sound preaching against sin. The word's hardly brought up. It's been accepted now that we just, God just loves us, do the best you can. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of this stuff is being put on TV to draw the youth is nothing but glorified flesh sitting there saying, I want you to know God made me quit dope. God ain't interested in you quitting dope. He's interested in you getting right with God. You get right with God, you quit it all. And then they said, and I say, God's going to help me. God can't help us. He ain't got nothing to work with. Man-centered gospel. Humanistic. That's why in all the meetings that they're having with the government now, they're having a lot of Eastern mystic religions to show up. And even Farrakhan, we're afraid to say anything about him. Amen. And also, let me tell you, also we're having a lot of the New Age movement meeting with our government officials now under the guise of their religion, but they're not having any fundamentalist, Bible believers, Christian. You know why? We're a problem. We won't go along. We're intolerant. Well, we are. We're as intolerant as the Word of God. Sin is sin. God, help us to cry aloud and spare not and lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show the house of Jacob their transgressions, Isaiah said. I don't care. I'm not going to be on no who's who. And they're not going to put no accolades on me because I ain't ever amended to nothing. But that really don't matter if I've only amounted to what God wants me to be and be faithful in preaching. God, could you just show up? Oh, you say, but he's here. Oh, I know he's in us. But I mean that moment when the Holy Presence of God sits down to where people fall on their face singing, Oh, Hell, the power of Jesus' name. Awesomeness of God is a missing thing today. What's man going to get out of it? What's God going to do for me? How's he going to make me prosper? Is he going to make me healthy? Oh, if Jesus will come and do all that, I'll go with him. That is not it, folks. Amen? This sin, we've sinned. Then another reason why that we must have revival in verse 7. There's none that call up upon thy name. Not many people stirring up themselves to take hold of thee. You've hid your face from us and you've consumed us because of our iniquity. And here's what Isaiah is saying. There just ain't nobody laying hold of you anymore. No intercession, no concern, no brokenness, no tears, no midnight cries of moms and dads and grandfathers. We've had accepted the fact that our grandkids are pretty good kids and they're going to get saved somewhere down the road. But ladies and gentlemen, I've got news for you. All of this usually happens when somebody lays hold of God and won't turn loose until God tracks that grandson down and hymns him up and won't let him out till he gets saved. I've seen revival break out when 10 and 12-year-old children would come to the altar praying for a drunken dad and pray with such sobbing tears and go home so broken that th through that kid's prayers and brokenness, I'm talking about years ago, little old kids. Well, now you can't hardly get anybody on the altar. We're all fine. We're all doing well. It's everything going to be all right. But I hear the testimonies of old drunken husbands who remembers the night they walked in and heard their wives in there on their face before God saying, God, I won't turn loose till you save my husband. Amen? Testimonies of teenagers. They could hear moms in the wee hours of the morning saying, God, save my boy or I'm going to die. We're so comfortable. Which got it so easy. No interruptions. Just let me make my money. Let me live for myself. Let me do as I please. But I'm going to tell you, it's when some people lay hold of God and say, God, that's what happened in the island of the Hebrides with Duncan Campbell. It wasn't Duncan Campbell that brought the revival. It was some praying saints, brother, that wouldn't stop until heaven broke in and the whole island was turned to God. Amen? Hey, in, I believe it was Samuel Chadwick, 
that I was reading about. The England, the New England churches had gotten down to where 17 people were a crowd, and nobody would come. One man said, the church is through. There'll be no more church in the New England states. And this is usually the way churches go. You hit, you hit that time of revival, you know, there's always desperation, then there's manifestation, then there's revelation. That's the way the revival cycle is. Desperation, manifest, a revelation, manifestation, then comes abundance. And after abundance, right back to independence. That's the cycle of revival. But I believe God's about to get some of us back to desperation. I just in Oklahoma. Brother Bill in a meeting with old Jerry Dunn talked about you every day. Lord, I thought we'd find something better than that to talk about. Well, we didn't, but talked about Bill every day. But anyway, Oklahoma's in sad trouble with their wheat crops this year. I mean, folks, young farmers plowing up all the wheat that at this time should have been a bump, bumper crop and watched them stand there and weep on TV saying, we'll probably lose everything we got. Dry! Their topsoil being blown to other places, blowing away. Listen to me. I do not believe we're desperate yet. And I don't believe God's going to move until there's some cries of desperation. God, it's my grandson. I've sort of taken it for granted. I've got so used to watching TV, and I don't want to miss my program, but I tell you what, Lord, I'm going to go in here tonight. I'm going to lay hold of God. Don't let my grandson go to hell. That's the cry that God hears. None is stirring up himself to lay hold of me. Oh, man, I've had to deal with myself. I'm lazy. I'm a procrastinator. I can be so lazy. When I hear, that's why I want to hear somebody like Dr. John put so much time and does such a super job and knows so much. I don't know. I, I would be uncomfortable around him, but he's such a great guy. You don't feel that way because he's a super, super guy. You know, some of these guys that know so much, I, I, don't, I can't be comfortable around them. They're too smart for me. Amen. But Dr. John is not that way at all. But when you hear that, you just feel you just feel lazy, lazy. But boy, has God ever dealt with me? I remember Manly Beasley, and I'd hardly preach a meeting without referring to Manly, because he had such an impact on my life. The last time that I saw him, before his funeral, was in uh, Conroe, Texas, and we were fixing to preach. Uh, the last conference I preached with him was in January before he died in July. Now, I remember Manley was in the next room uh, at the hotel in uh, Holiday Inn there in Conroe, and he, he couldn't get dressed. And I remember, Brother Ed, you helped him. You remember that time? You helped him because, and we had to help him get dressed and help him get to the car and help him because he was dying. And yet the last thing he said was, don't you forget and don't you let this world stop you from believing God that at any given time, revival could take our country. And you preach it. And don't you, don't you, don't you back up. You stay by it. So they'll laugh at you, but I'm going to tell you, the more desperate a nation gets, the more we need the message of revival and the second coming. Amen? By the way, folks, if revival doesn't come, I'm not going to be discouraged. <laughs> Who's going to be discouraged when you're going to take a plane air ride and just get plumb out of here? Amen? Who worries about it? You say, well, do, do you believe it could happen? I believe at any given time God could sweep our nation. I believe he could zap President Clinton in the Oval Office. I believe he could. If we hold on to God. Amen? But we're too busy fussing, grumbling, complaining, griping about the economy. Hey, folks, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And if you think these are bad days, you, thank God I'm 63. My, I don't know how much longer I got, but for some of you young ones, I feel sorry for you. I do. It's going to get worse. You say, you're a pessimist. No, God just says it is. You can crusade that you drop dead. It's going to get worse. We must have revival because nobody's laying hold of God. And then another reason why we must have revival, look here in verse 10. The holy cities are a wilderness. Zion's a wilderness. Jerusalem, the desolation, are holy in our beautiful house where our fathers praise these burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Does that sound like we're where we are today? Hey, 
people only make fun and laugh. Atheists only show their head. And the ACLU only gets bold when we're not in revival. You let, you let a holy God show up, he'll shut their mouth. I get right tickled. They holler for the baby seals. and we, our, our, our paper in Chattanooga, uh, Chattanooga News Free Press is a Christian newspaper. I mean, there's Christians on Easter. The, the editorial page of the Chattanooga News Free Press is the resurrection story with a gospel and an invitation to sinners. That's the editorial page. At, the, at Christmas time, the editorial page is the birth, virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. And he is going to the cross. That's the editorial page of our Chattanooga News Free Press, Christian paper. The other day they wrote a little article in here said we're always wondering whether or not how we should kill these, these people who, have, who are murderers. Whether we should electrocute them, gas them, hang them, or give them an injection. I said do all four. <laughs> Just make sure they're gone. Why? Get them out of the way. If you don't, they're going to take some more folks to hell with them. Amen. And I'll tell you something else. You know what they said in that little article? Why don't we just crush their brains, crush their heads and suck their brains out like we do partial born babies? That was the editorial in the Chattanooga News Free Press. Why don't we just crush their heads and suck their brains out. That's how we're killing our babies. You believe that's a good paper? Y'all ought to subscribe for it. Amen. I'm telling you, they lay it on the line and they take no liquor advertisement. Haven't in all the years they've been in Chattanooga, have never taken one liquor advertisement. And they've made more money than the Chattanooga Times owned by a bunch of unbelievers. I won't even drive by that place. I'll go around the block to avoid the Chattanooga time. <laughs> Church is desolate. We're moving every way we can to get a crowd except revival. The mandate of revival is the last thing, and I'm through. Look at this. First of all, there's an agonizing passion. Listen to Isaiah. Oh, God! Can you hear his heart? Can you hear his very emotion? And I'm going to tell you something, folks. The closer we get to the end time, the more it's going to take everything we've got to stand true to the Word of God. It's going to take all the emotion, intensity, and agony of spirit and heart. We are never going to see any better days than we're seeing now. And to stand up and lift up your voice like a trumpet is going to be warfare and tiredness and weariness, but all oh, for the glorious privilege of honoring God till we die. Listen to him. Can you hear him? Oh, God! Would you rend the heavens? I'm an old man now. The nation is still desolate. They hadn't heard me. But if you could just show up, rend the heavens, and just come down in awesome glory, that even the adversaries will know your name, and the nations will tremble at your presence. You see, I don't really believe that most of us even seated here believe that the real only hope that we have for America is an invasion of God. We don't really believe that. You still believe that if we get the right president in office next time, we'll get some relief. Hey, there won't be no relief until there's revival. Until there's revival. Amen? Until there's a turning back to God. Agonizing passion. Then secondly, I think there must be an acknowledgement of sin. I think it's going to be a real confession. Because he said in verse 5, we have sinned. And then he says, we are an unclean thing. Filthy, we are filthy rags. And we fade as a leaf. Our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. I think it's going to be an acknowledgement of sin. Lord God. I was reading Nehemiah this morning. Got plum blessed when he said, Lord, we don't deserve any help. We turned against you. We've sinned. I've sinned. He didn't just include them. He included himself. And you know, the sweetest times in my life is not when I'm in a Holy Ghost meeting preaching and people are shouting and having a big time. The sweetest time in my life is when I'm broken before God saying, God, 
I'm just cold. I just tell you the truth, Lord, I'd like to level off on some level and sort of take it easy and sort of coast my way through the rest of my years until that voice comes. You fall on your face and say, I'd rather die where I am now than to ever let up or cut back from declaring the whole counsel of God. Amen. And then the third thing, and I'm through, we must be awakened to our throne rights. I'm not talking about these throne rights that these, some of these people talk about, that you can order God around and tell him what to do. I'm not talking about that. But when I got saved, God gives me throne rights, and that is this, to come boldly to the throne of grace and just stand there and say, Jesus, this is my heart. This is what I want you to do. It's, it's, it, if you could just send Holy Ghost, heaven sent revival. I was in Westside Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, and this one I'm through. I've been in that church for 12 years, 12 straight years. I uh, never shall forget, on a, I went from a Sunday through a Sunday, Sunday morning through the following Sunday night. Nothing actually happened during the meeting except a few get saved, and some come to the altar, some got joined the church, and just seemed like just a typical meeting until Sunday night came. And I brought a short message on the second coming and thought I would just leave and go home. And at 20 minutes late, I gave the invitation. At 11 o'clock, it stopped. I tried to stop it many times because I thought it was over. And about that time, when you'd start to stop it, an old boy would jump up and say, Hold it, my daddy's coming. He's coming to get saved. And he'd have his dad coming down the aisle. And that went on for those two hours and 20 minutes and 187 people. If you don't believe that, call this number. 904-781-0618. Double dog dare you. Call them and ask them. You say, why do you do that? A lot of preachers just give out statistics. Got news for you, folks. That night I was so tired I had to sit down to give the invitation. That's why I know I got to have a glorified body. I gave out that night, but oh, in heaven, I won't ever give out. Hey, we dealt with every one of them. We left the meeting at 12.30 in the morning. 97 of those made first-time professions of faith. You said, was it your preaching? Probably the sorriest, wasn't expecting nothing, going to preach and get out of there and go home. But all of a sudden, heaven came down. You say, when you say God showed up, oh yeah, it wasn't my sermon. The sweetest sights in the world is when God just moves in and everything just comes alive.